it's uh, eight eight thirty, so um, I'm not sure who's all on the call, but um, I'd like to call the Stakeholders Relations Committee to order. And uh, the first uh, uh, item on the agenda is approval <clears throat> of our November 12th uh, 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 meeting. And so I'd like to have uh, um, a motion. So moved. Second. Okay. Um, did I have a, a motion? You seconded it, Anne. Stephanie made the motion. Okay. So I missed that. Okay. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Anne. Uh, any uh, uh, corrections to the minutes? Seeing none, do I, have a, uh, do, uh, I have a vote to approve? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Aye. Now, there's only one item on the uh, agenda. Uh, and um, so, um, what are they? now, Ellie, are, is Ellie on? Ellie Newman? I am here. Good morning. Oh. Good morning, Ellie. I guess you're going to be uh, giving us the 2020 annual service report. I guess it's a pension, so it's an update also, right? Yep. Yeah, it will be an overview of the reports and the highlights of that. Okay, thank you. So whenever you're ready, Ellie. Great. Well, good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Ellie Newman. I'm the manager of transit analysis here at Port Authority, and I'll be giving you an overview of our most recent annual service report. Um, so this report is sort of our State of the Union speech for our transit system. Um, so we go through, we evaluate every aspect of our service. We compare ourselves to peer agencies and show how we're doing relative to other cities. Um, so it's a really comprehensive document and definitely worth a look. Um, and as part of this, we also evaluate service requests. Um, so these are requests that come in from the community, maybe for a new route or additional weekend service. We prioritize these and rank them in order of which ones we think would be the best blend of efficiency, effectiveness, and equity. And this report is based on the fiscal year 2020, which as you know, is July 2019 through June of 2020. So the headline story of the report is that our ridership dropped sharply in fiscal year 20, which is probably no surprise um, to anyone. We were on track for about a 1% increase through February. And then of course, ridership kind of went off a cliff um, in mid-March through now. Um, so we ended up finishing the year at 51.7 million, which is a 19% drop in ridership from the previous year. I thought it was interesting to have a split out by mode and by month so that you can really see um, exactly how our ridership has changed. So here on the left hand side, we've got the bus only ridership comparing month by month for 2019 versus 2020. Um, so you can see we were running pretty even with 2019 up through March. We had a 25% or 35% decline went all the way down to 72% in April, and then it really started to come back up to about minus 50%, minus 60%. Um, and I think that speaks sort of to how resilient our bus ridership has been. Um, obviously, there are some discretionary riders, but a lot of people that depend on our service to get to their essential jobs, to get to life functions like grocery stores, medical appointments, and that kind of thing. And it's a very different story when you look at our light rail. Um, you can see it went down to minus 91% in April and didn't really bounce back too much um, since then. And that speaks to how our ridership on the light rail side is just sort of less diverse in terms of the type of terms of the type of people that ride. It's very much a downtown commute oriented service. Uh, on the weekend, we've got people going to sports and special events, and really all of that demand dried up in the spring and really hasn't come back. Next slide. Uh, uh, Ellie, let me interrupt you for one second on the modes of, of transportation. Have we done, is there something done on access also? Do we have something on that? 
Yeah, that's in the report. Oh, um, no. Access came back to about a 50% um, of previous years. So that's a, that's kind of similar to our bus where there's a lot of people that are very dependent on that service um, and are still using it to get to essential functions. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so back to on-time performance, um, this was a nice story. We've um, kind of struggled a little bit, as you can see, to raise our on-time performance for the past several years. And we ended up having about a 4% increase on both modes. Um, there's a few reasons for that. One is that we installed a new OTP system in fiscal year 20 that we think is more accurate. I think it does a better job of sort of knowing what trip the bus is supposed to hit with the schedule. Um, and so it kind of showed that we were maybe more on time than we ever thought we were. Um, we obviously go through and adjust the schedules every quarter as well to try and match the schedules to reality a bit better. So that paid off a little bit. Um, and also when the pandemic hit, that reduced traffic and congestion on the road. So we weren't getting our buses stuck downtown or getting them stuck in a bridge or in a tunnel somewhere. Um, so we were able to raise our OTP. Next slide. Um, so next I'm going to talk about our service standards evaluation. Um, so for this, we go through and we rank all of our routes based on our internal standards for passengers per hour, on-time performance, um, crowding, and a few other things. Um, for this, we only used July 2019 through March of 2020 so that we weren't including the kind of pandemic times data, which would really um, sort of muddy the waters, we thought. Uh, so for passengers per hour, we did identify some lower performing routes that weren't running as many passengers as we would like to see. Um, so we did note those in the report. Normally we would specify what we were gonna do to improve that, um, but obviously with our capacity restrictions still in place, excuse me, and ridership patterns just have changed so much, we're not going to be acting on that right now. So it's kind of in our back pocket. For on-time, um, if you go back one, for on-time performance, <clears throat> we again had an overall improvement, but we also raised our standards. Um, so depending on the route type, we might expect an 80% on-time performance or 90% on-time performance. And so we didn't increase enough to meet the new standards. So 77% were below the standard. Um, so we certainly have our work cut out for us there. Um, and then on crowding, we have struggled for a while with having rush hour crowding problems pre-pandemic. Um, so we've noted all the routes that had those issues in the report. Um, and of course, since the pandemic, we cut capacity on our vehicles to about 30% of seated capacity. Um, and even with the drop in ridership, we've had some issues with crowding on um, certain routes where more, more than 15 people want to get on a bus um, and we just can't fit that many people right now. So our current focus, and it has been that way since March, um, is trying to address crowding on those five or 10 routes that have that problem um, and are having to pass riders up due to our new limits. So new for this year, we did a Title VI evaluation on all of our routes. And if you're not familiar with that, um, it is a federal program to make sure that transit agencies are appropriately serving low-income areas and minority areas and are not providing worse service to those areas. So that will look at um, such things as service plan and frequency, crowding, on-time performance, and out of service. And uh, in virtually every case, we found that we were providing at least as good service, if not better, with two important exceptions. Um, so I mentioned just now that crowding has been a issue, kind of a surprising issue to some, um, with our reduced capacities. That was very much the case in low income routes and minority routes serving minority race areas. Um, and the reason for that is in late March, we implemented a kind of across the board 25% service cut, but we found that our ridership did not drop evenly across the system. 
So routes that serve low income areas and routes that serve minority dominated communities still having fairly strong ridership, which was translating to more crowding on those routes. So as we started to realize that, we worked really hard with the scheduling team to add back service on routes that um, were having crowding issues. So we made several adjustments over the, um, over the spring and summer. Then in the most recent schedule change in November, we did a really major um, service change to address crowding where we, uh, in some cases, even doubled service um, on routes, as well as redeploying our 60 foot buses to make sure that they were, uh, the larger buses were being used appropriately where we could put them in. Um, so we've really been working on the crowding and we think we've made some significant adjustments there. <clears throat> and then finally on out of service, um, this one only affected minority routes um, versus non-minority routes. Um, and when we dug into it, we realized the reason was because every route that runs out of the East Liberty division is considered a minority route. And we were having some staffing shortages there um, that were kind of creating manpower issues and we were having to cancel more trips because we didn't have enough people to run them every day. Uh, so that was a little bit harder to address uh, because we had to move people rather than buses. Um, but in the November pick, we were able to move some operators over to East Liberty from other divisions and most recently have seen out of service almost evaporate based on, um, you know, compared to what it was through the summer and fall. It's really declined now because of what we were able to do on the scheduling side. Um, so finally, on our service requests. For fiscal year 20, we received 46 new requests that we went through and prioritized. Um, we now have a backlog of 215 requests that the community is asking for that we would like to put in and we kind of have them ready to go in terms of planning. Um, the implementation of that is on hold right now. We don't yet know what our budget situation is going to be. So we're going to, rather than put things in that we might have to take back, we'd rather just kind of wait for more clarity and make sure that we can guarantee the service for anything that we would add. So that concludes my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions. Are there any questions of, uh, of uh, committee members? Okay, any uh, uh, additional board members have any questions? Uh, that was a very good Go ahead. I have a quick question. Um, Ellie, when we're talking about 250, 215 requests total, when we're looking at that based on planning, based on budget, all of those kinds of things, saying in a perfect world that we would have the budget, how long would it take for us to implement some of those changes? And out of the 215, what a guesstimate and I won't hold you to it, a guesstimate, how many of those might be doable? Now, I realize it's gonna be financial because each one will have a different cost, but what are we thinking we might be able to do? Sure, um, so I will say that the, um, the, the request that scored best this year was our BRT service request. Um, and that's kind of one of those magic unicorn requests that has a cost savings, but a projected ridership gain because of all the expected um, service improvements that should drive ridership. Um, so that one we think would have a fairly strong chance of being implemented um, possibly early, but certainly when the BRT um, service goes into effect in 2023. Um, I will say that the, the list right now is many, many millions of dollars if we were to implement things um, and to increase them to implement all of those requests, I would think we would need to expand to a fifth division. Um, so it would certainly be a very, very large undertaking, but I think it's helpful to see the scope of the service that we're being asked to put in relative to what we can put in, just to show how much demand there is that's kind of untapped in our area for more transit service. Okay, that's interesting um, that we would need to go to a fifth di division for you to quantify it in that way. Okay, all right, thank you. 
Thank you. If there's uh, no additional questions, as uh, in keeping with uh, past practice, are there any stakeholder groups on the call? Laura, are you on the call? I'm a little surprised that there's no stakeholder groups on the call. But anyways, um, uh, so if there's no uh, further questions, a uh, very good presentation. Uh, uh, what, what I like to hear is the flexibility, the ability to, to adjust service when needed. I think that's important. I think that's an important thing in reference to uh, uh, prioritize and request. And there's some requests that uh, are going to be difficult, uh, Michelle, to, to, to meet, period, uh, because it, it just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't mean people have, don't have a right to ask that question. They do, but I think that's it. Uh, anyways, uh, Ellie, if, if you're done, and uh, um, I'm not sure is, is, is it, I'm not sure who's at the podium. Uh, Board Member Tag, this is David Huffaker, um, uh, Chief Development Officer, and I, I was going to respond to the question that Ellie was responding to, but she covered, I think, all the salient points. I do think uh, just one note um, that I, I did want to address because you raised the question of the flexibility. Ellie talked about some of the garage constraints, but one of the other uh, factors is sort of the timeline, and we have a long lead time before any service changes can be put in place. So we have to use the best information at hand when we're making those service decisions. And I, I will note that um, uh, for me to have uh, some of those significant changes that Ellie was describing implemented in November kind of makes, makes your head scratch a little bit and, and think about why did it take so long. If you'll recall, back in June, when we were finalizing our August uh, and September service changes, um, we were looking at actually a fairly optimistic scenario with COVID. And so we were uh, sort of, um, we had to make a call as to whether the, the, we were going to see a return to normal or if we were going to continue with uh, the COVID uh, scenario. And we were a little bit nervous about getting caught uh, without capacity if people did start to return to the office. As we all know, right after June is, is when uh, the sort of second wave hit uh, Allegheny County, and so that did not happen, and that kind of freed us up to do some of those November changes that we had been looking at, at implementing in the summer, but it, the timing just did not work out, and unfortunately, we had to wait till November for some of those changes. But we are encouraged by some of the, the results we've seen, particularly in January as we've uh, made it through the holidays and we start to see some of the, the operators return uh, from, from uh, COVID uh, restrictions. Well, one, one thing's important to me is that we're meeting our Title VI obligations that we're basically, and, and, and quite frankly, going a little bit farther if we can. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, if there's no additional, do I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Okay, thanks. Uh, meeting stands in adjournment until uh, next month. Thank you. Okay. We'll let uh, staff get uh, moved around here and then we'll start the finance committee here in a second. Let me pull up the agenda. Okay, I will call to order the Finance Committee on January 21st, 2021. The first item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from the November 12th Finance Committee meeting. Do I have anyone with any questions or revisions to those minutes? Could I have a motion to approve the minutes? I'll move to approve. Okay, and a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> All right, motion carried. The minutes are, are approved. And uh, second agenda item then is um, a resolution to authorize uh, the application and entering into an agreements for calendar year 2021 operating and capital grant funds. Pete, I will let you describe that. Good morning. So this uh, resolution uh, is done on an annual basis. Uh, this is uh, requesting authorization for a blanket approval 
to enter into uh, various federal, state, and local grants for, this would cover calendar year 2021. Um, on an annual basis, uh, we uh, uh, apply for numerous federal grants, uh, 5307 urban area uh, formula uh, program funding grants, and uh, a number of others that are listed uh, in the resolution. In addition, we also apply to uh, the Commonwealth, uh, specifically to PennDOT, for both the operating and capital grants. And uh, we also, um, on an annual basis, will make applications to Allegheny County for both operating and capital budget um, funding applications. Uh, in addition, there are instances where there's discretionary grants that we uh, apply for during the calendar year. <clears throat> so what this resolution is requesting is just blanket approval for um, either the chief executive officer, chief financial officer, the director of grants and capital programs, and uh, the chief development officer uh, to apply for and enter into these various grant agreements uh, for calendar year 2021. And uh, what I will do on, and what I uh, currently do is include in my monthly staff report a listing of the various grants that we would, would have applied for uh, during the preceding month. So um, I don't know if there's any questions. Uh, I do not have any questions. Anyone else from the committee or the board? I right. don't. Thanks. Um, do I have a motion to uh, recommend this for the board's approval next week? So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries and we'll uh, vote on that next week. All Thank right. Thank you very much. And um, Pete, you can go ahead and move into our next agenda item, which is November and December 2020 financial statements. Yeah, so we're, we have double duty this month uh, since there was no um, board meeting in December. So I will uh, review quickly uh, the November since they're very similar uh, to the December results. Um, but. Um, Total operating income for November was uh, about five and a half million dollars below budget. Um, every income category uh, was below budget for the month. Uh, that includes passenger revenue, which was $4.7 million below budget. Our total operating income year to date through November was $28 million below budget. Um, Likewise, all in operating income categories uh, through uh, the first five months of the fiscal year were below budget. And uh, as I've stated at uh, prior monthly meetings, this variance uh, can be indirectly recouped through our CARES Act funding. And, and I do have an update uh, on our CARES Act uh, invoicing to date uh, later in the presentation. Okay. Uh, Jeff, can you hit that? From an expense and subsidy uh, perspective, our total expenses for November were $2.9 million below budget with every expense category other than wages and salaries uh, ending the month of November below budget. Our expense uh, through November was $20.5 million below budget. Uh, likewise, all expense categories other than wages and salaries ending uh, the first five months under budget. <clears throat> Our subsidies for the month of November and year to date uh, through November uh, were above budget and that was principally due to higher state operating and assistance and uh, the fact that we're using CARES Act funding which um, was not uh, a budgeted item. The state operating assistance variance uh, strictly a timing issue, and this is expected to normalize by the end of the fiscal year. Hey, Pete, I had a quick question on the 
Um, on the expense side, it looked like other expenses were 2.5 million over budget. Um, maybe that's a year to date. I just was curious what that what that okay. was. You mean uh, from from last year? Yes, I guess it was comparing the fiscal years. Yeah, the, uh, last year we did receive a um, um, an insurance reimbursement that I believe is uh, that uh, uh, reduced last year's last year's total. But I will uh, uh. verify that and um, send out an email to the uh, to the board to that effect. Okay, just checking. Thanks. Um, yeah, so for the so year over year results for November, our operating income was 20, uh, $27.9 million below last fiscal, fiscal year's total. Uh, 25.2 of that was due to the lower passenger revenues as a result of the pandemic. Our expenses uh, year over year through November were $4.3 million above last fiscal year. That's due to higher wages and salaries, uh, benefits, and other expenses. Our total subsidies, uh, however, $12.8 million above last fiscal year, and that's due to uh, uh, anticipation of uh, total operating assistance high, being higher than last year, then also the fact that um, we're receiving CARES Act funding in the subsidy category, um, which was not in last year's uh, actuals. Any questions on the November statement? So then turning to the December, and that, that'll be our halfway point for the fiscal year, um, our total operating income for the month uh, was $5.6 million under budget, very similar to uh, no, November. Uh, our passenger revenues were 5.17 million under budget uh, due to the continued low ridership as the result of the pandemic. <clears throat> At our midpoint, our uh, total operating income is $33.6 million below plan. Every re revenue category is uh, below plan at the mid-year, and uh, we are making up that shortfall with our CARES Act invoicing. For expenses and total subsidy, our total expense for December was $626,054 uh, $626, uh, under budget. I should mention that uh, in employee benefits, we did have to make a $1.82 million retroactive uh, catch-up payment to the ATU pension plan. So that's why that category was $1.22 million over budget, and that's just based on what um, the market results are um, of the pension plan. So um, it can it, there can be years where, if market results are are better than um, the actuarial um, anticipated amount, it could flip the other way. So okay. uh, utilities exceeded budget due to higher propulsion, telecommunications, and natural gas expense. Good news, at the midpoint of the fiscal year, our total expenses are $21.1 million below budget, with every category other than salary and wages below budget. Uh, what that does is, if we continue on that trend, uh, just as a reminder, the fiscal 21 budget was balanced using about $42 million in deferred revenue, or the, the piggy bank per se. So if that trend continues of uh, being under budget on expenses, uh, we would have to use less of the uh, deferred revenue in fiscal 2021. Our total subsidy for the month was $4.6 million below budget, uh, and that's due to lower local and state subsidy. Uh, the local subsidy variance was offset uh, with CARES, uh, county CARES funding. And our total subsidy at the midpoint of the fiscal year is $3.06 million above budget, uh, and that's due to timing issues in CARES receipt uh, versus the budget in uh, offset, offsetting subsidy categories. 
and then moving to the uh, December year over year, total operating income is 33.6 million below last fiscal year, um, and that's due to the pandemic. In income shortfalls uh, are being reimbursed through CARES reimbursement. Our, our total expenses uh, at the midpoint are 6.6 .6 million higher than fiscal 20, and that's uh, as in November due to higher wages and salaries and benefits. Subsidy uh, at the midpoint is 14.8 million higher than last fiscal year, and that's due to uh, the use of the CARES Act funding. And then from an operating reserve, I'll just look, we'll just look at the uh, December. Um, the authority began the month of December with about $138.7 million in operating reserves. Uh, we received $35.2 million in revenues and subsidies. Uh, we had cash outflows of uh, approximately $45 million for payroll benefits, uh, materials and services. We ended December with $128.9 million in operating reserves. Are there any questions on the December uh, statements? I'm good. And then, thank you. Okay, hearing none. Uh, so then, just an update uh, as promised on the CARES Act. We received, now this is the first log of CARES Act money. Uh, we are still waiting from uh, STC to get the final update on the uh, second uh, federal stimulus. Uh, as of yesterday, that uh, information was, was not available, but we're hoping that we get something within the next week. Um, so this is the first log of CARES Act. We received $141.72 million of the uh, urbanized areas allotment of $162.18 million. <clears throat> We've invoiced $55.8 million. Uh, this is through September. We have $85.92 million remaining. We used, uh, of the $55.8 million that uh, we've invoiced, $31.5 million of that was used to balance last fiscal year's budget. Uh, we've invoiced $24.3 million uh, for the fiscal 21, our current budget, and uh, I should have another invoice uh, ready to go out uh, tomorrow or Monday, and that would probably be in the 9 to $10 million range. So uh, that's just a status update on where we stand on the, the CARES Act funding. Uh, Kate, oh, uh, yeah. I have a quick question. Uh, is FTA pretty good about um, how quickly they turn around the payment of those invoices? I know sometimes when you've got a new program or a new initiative, there's, you know, a little bit of a lag time or a longer, you know, payment cycle. I was just wondering how that was working. Yeah, I will say they, they can turn it around probably within two to three days. So, oh, wow. Uh, okay. We, we would, if I submit it on uh, Friday or Monday, I should have it uh, late next week. So it's, it's really a quick turnaround. Okay, great. I'm sorry, John, did you have a question? I cut yeah, you off. I just, uh, just had a question on the uh, operating income. Now, I'm assuming that the the operating income, uh, the reduction in that it was at the uh, at the, uh, at the end of the fiscal year. And so, in other words, I was trying to determine whether we could only use that COVID Monday for loss connected directly to uh, COVID. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of cumbersome how they they go about doing it. Um, mm -hmm. You have to identify expenses that no longer are supported by lost either revenue or subsidy. So, so for instance, the Port Authority, we have a number of expenses that are already covered through federal money in our operating budget. Uh, preventive, our preventive maintenance program, which is a lot of um, uh, Don Rivetti's. Uh, Preventive maintenance on the on the bus side. Um, that's 80% federal money, and it's about 28 million dollars uh, on an annual basis. So we have to be very careful that we don't identify expenses that are already being uh, funded by the federal government. So predominantly, the invoices that we're submitting are to cover operator uh, law uh, wages um, and and benefits. 
so uh, that can total uh, anywhere from nine to ten million dollars on a monthly basis. Um, so uh, we don't actually have to go through and like identify the actual lost revenue. We just have to identify expenses that are no longer supported by the lost revenue. So um, that's just the way the the um, legislation is set up. Yeah, it is. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yes, Peter. Thanks. It is. It is cumbersome. You're right. Are there any other questions I can answer? Thank you very much. Thank you, Pete. Um, all right. I think that was all we had on our agenda today. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. And a second. Second. Thank you. Um, we will uh, touch base again next month. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ann. Good morning, everyone. Um, let's get ready for the Performance Oversight Committee for our January 2020, 2021 meeting. So if we need to shift people positions and papers, take a moment to do so, and then we will get started. Okay, I'm seeing that we already have someone at our, our podium. Tony, is that you this morning? It is me. Okay, good morning. All right, we have one bit of business and then we'll get to your resolution. So I'm going to call a performance oversight meeting for January 21st, 2021 to order. Our first item of business will be the approval of our meeting minutes for November of uh, 2020. We had no December meeting, so we're approving the November meeting. Um, and I'm just asking for a motion to approve these minutes. We are going to check the attendance though, just to make sure that we had everyone's um, name. And uh, Jeff assured us we do have a recording, so we'll be able to figure out who was here and who was in attendance because we need to check um, that staff. So that was back in November. So after uh, a review of the meeting minutes, does anyone have any changes or corrections <laughs> other than checking our attendance for our minutes? No, I make a motion to approve. Thank you, Austin. Do I have a second to approve our meeting minutes, please? Second. Okay, great. Thank you, Jeff. All right, so our November meeting minutes are approved. Moving forward to item number two, our proposed resolution. So good morning, Mr. Trona. How are you? Good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you. I'm very well. Good morning, uh, committee members. I have five items for your review and presentation to the full board for approval. The first is biodiesel fuel. This is a change order. At its April 2020 meeting, the board authorized an agreement with Gutman Energy for the purchase of uh, biodiesel fuel for a one-year period with an option for a one-year period. The contract permits the staff to look into future pricings in order to stabilize the authority's fuel budget. At this time, staff is requesting the second-year option period to be exercised to enable the authority to take advantage of current futures. Marketing prices at this time that would benefit the authority. Since 2018, Gutman Energy has successfully completed the biodiesel fuel contract and staff concludes that they have performed well throughout the duration of these contracts. So our recommendation is that the amendment be executed with Gutman Energy and the estimated amount of $12,729,600 to exercise the optional one-year period. This will bring the total contract value to $25,459,200. This price, this price for the additional one-year period is in accordance with the agreement. We've done this um, as a strategy since I've been the director to uh, go out and get future pricing to stabilize our pricing in the futures market. As the price changes daily, hourly, uh, John DeAngelis follows it very carefully. We read up on the, on the market and we're able to uh, go out and get pricing at that time because it changes so rapidly. So by approving this option year gives us that, um, that benefit. Number two, 40 foot low floor diesel transit coaches. This is also a change order. 
At its June 2016 meeting, the board authorizes an agreement with Gillig for the purchase of 70 40 foot low floor coaches with an option to purchase up to an additional 400 coaches over the next five years. At our October 2017 meeting, the board authorized a change order to purchase 69 coaches. November 18, additional 59 coaches, and November 19, additional 54 coaches. There is a need for the authority to exercise this option in order to continue the process of replacing existing vehicles, which are 12 years old and have excess of 500,000 miles. The staff, is an the staff has identified an additional 40-foot coach requirement, four spare engines, and four spare transmission packages to continue the replacement program. So our recommendation that the contract be amended and executed with Gillig in the amount of $21,542,428, uh, which will execute the 40 additional uh, low floor coaches, spare engines, and transmissions. The price for these additional coaches and engines and transmissions represent the pricing received through the purchase of the uh, coaches in the original uh, contract from 2016. Number three, the remaining three items were all uh, are advertised and our e-business documents were distributed. Number three is diesel engine oil. Five firms accepted our invitation, four bids were received for engine oil over a one-year period. It's our recommendation that the contract be awarded to the low responsive, responsive bidder, which was Allegheny Petroleum, estimated amount of 248,000 over a one-year period. This price represents a 2% decrease from the previous contracted price. Number four, deep cleaning, disinfecting, and efficacy testing reporting at PAC facilities. 17 firms accepted the invitation, 12 bids were received for this deep cleaning of facilities over a two-year period. The low bidders stated that they were unable to hire the manpower to complete the services as specified in our, in our contract and could not complete an agreement accordingly therefore is ineligible for award. So our recommendation that the contract be awarded to the low responsive, responsive bidder, which was Terminex Commercial, estimated amount of 194,000 over a two year period. The low bidder in this case was GDI Services. The difference from their price to the, our recommended price is approximately $14,000. Number five is bus batteries. Nine firms accepted the invitation, six bids were received for AGM type batteries over a two year period. The low bidder that proposed that, uh, uh, items that were not in compliance with our technical specifications, therefore ineligible for award. The second low bidder also proposed items that were not in compliance with our technical specification and therefore is unable to uh, be eligible for the award. It's our recommendation that the contract be awarded to Northeast Battery an alternator in the estimated amount of $202,680 over a two-year period. This price represents a 3% increase from the previous contracted price for this two years ago. The low bidder was East Penn, and they quoted uh, the difference between their quote and our recommended is $34,000. The main specification in this contract was cold cranking amps and they were significantly lower than what we've specified for our buses. The second low bidder was interstate batteries. They also did not meet the specifications for cold cranking amps, and their price difference was 21,000 to the recommended price. That completes my report. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Mr. Trona. Do I have any questions from our committee members for Mr. Trona on any of these uh, proposals? No, thank you. Okay, from the wider board, do I have any questions from any of our other board members for Mr. Trona? Hearing no other questions, could I have a motion to move this forward to our board uh, for the full meeting next Friday? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you very much. Motion is approved and is moving forward to our full board meeting on Friday. Moving, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Trona. Moving forward to proposed resolutions item B, authorization to extend agreements to private inspection and engineering services with Mr. Greg O'Hare. Good morning. How are you doing, Mr. O'Hare? I'm doing well, thank you. Uh, and yourself? 
Doing great, thanks. Can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Thank you. Well, good morning and happy new year. Uh, I'm Greg O'Hara, Assistant Director in the Engineering Department. And this resolution is an authorization to extend the agreement to provide inspection and engineering services. It's a work order based contract to perform inspection and engineering services. Some of the work performed under this contract are the federally required inspection of the 40 owned bridges and tunnels, as well as other inspections related to engineering services. On the right of the slide, you can see a uh, bridge inspection that is ongoing out near the, uh, the West Busway. So the original agreement was executed in May of 2017 when GAI Consultants Incorporated and SAI Consult the Engineers Incorporated. The initial four-year term was a one-year option. The initial not to exceed amount was $11 million. The current agreement expires May 31st, 2021 this year. This action is the exercise of the option year to extend the agreement through May 31st, 2022 with no change in dollar value. To date, the services have been completed in a satisfactory manner. We respectfully request the approval of resolution of authorization to exercise the extension of the one-year option to no increase in federal contract. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Do I hear any questions for Mr. O'Hare from any of our committee members? No, I make, no, I make okay. a motion to approve. Okay, great. Thank you, Austin. Do I have a second for the motion to carry forward? I'll second. Thank you, Mr. Letwin. Motion carries, that's item B, to the full board meeting. Our final authorization then is for settlement of public liability claim with Mr. Mike Setra. Good morning, Mr. Setra. How are you? Good morning. Uh, good morning, Madam Committee Chairwoman and committee members. Uh, this resolution would authorize Port Authority to settle a public liability claim. An accident occurred on the morning of August 4th, 2016 at Port Authority's Collier Garage. Uh, Leo Hefferin, a tire technician for a subcontractor providing tire inspection and replacement services to Port Authority, was checking the tire tread depth and pressure on a rear bus tire when the bus began to move. Mr. Hefferin fell and suffered various injuries as a result of this accident and submitted a claim for monetary damages to Port Authority. Uh, following negotiations between the parties, we have agreed, uh, subject of course to Port Authority board approval, uh, to fully and finally settle Mr. Hefferin's claim for the total amount of $150,000 with no admission of fault or liability by the authority. Uh, subject to any member questions, I would respectfully request that the Performance Oversight Committee recommend this resolution authorizing Port Authority to settle this public liability claim and a release form approved by legal counsel to the full board for approval. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Setra. Any questions from our committee members on this issue? Any questions for our full board members for Mr. Setra on this issue? Hearing no questions, then I would entertain a motion to move this forward and a second. So moved. Thank you, second. Austin. Is that Mr. Letwin? Yep. Thank you for seconding. Um, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay, great. Motion carries uh, to our full board meeting. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. I have no further business on our agenda. And so I would uh, request a motion to um, adjourn. So move. Second. Yeah, second. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, thank you, everyone. I'll give a moment for everyone to shift to their next meeting. We'll be starting the technology committee meeting in a moment. I believe we have um, committee members available for the meeting and there's no action items beyond approval of minutes. So um, Jeff, if we can, can we move to the agenda with the approval of minutes or I can just do that. Does it, yeah, okay, we're gonna go there. So first, I believe the first item though was the approval of the minutes from our last meeting, which was in November of 2020. My, I, if everyone had time to review the minutes, I'd ask for a motion to approve. So moved. May I have a second? Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. Thank you very much. We have no business items on the agenda um, beyond the approval of the minutes, so I'm going to ask our technology department to go through a very exciting presentation that I reviewed last night um, for an update on our mobile ticketing service um, program. So please move forward. Cool. 
Good morning. Thank you. So uh, Mike Veltri is online with me here today. Uh, Mike is the project manager working through the, he's really knee deep in the day-to-day -day activities on this. Um, so he gave me the pleasure of getting to present this to you. If we have any questions, we'll bring Mike in uh, to answer any questions that we might have. So let's talk about the project for mobile ticketing services. We're in the current phase of installation and preparations, and this really includes installing validators on our bus and a rail and inclines and setting up the actual app that folks will be able to use from their mobile phones. And we're in the middle of that phase right now. Uh, the next phase is when we'll activate the base services, and then we'll be able to follow that with some other phases, including cash digitization and vendor portal and some other future things. But we really need to get through these first two phases first. As I think back to this, back in 2019 when we presented this project and, and we gave kudos to procurement and legal for all their work getting us to that contract phase. And I look at what has occurred over the past year, it, it's frankly amazing. And <laughs> I think about what Masabi, our vendor, has had to deal with. Uh, with everything that occurred in 2020, I don't think we need to go down that road again. They were using folks in Germany in their garage preparing cables. They had people across England using their living rooms to stack and pack boxes together. We actually think uh, the one engineer has a FedEx distribution site on his front stoop sitting in London so we could get all this equipment here to be able to install it. And then once it got here, such great work, and, and thanks really to all of our maintenance managers at the garage, the radio repair team, um, marketing and legal, working on trademark and legal, uh, Chuck Percoffee and his team helping us work through goofy little uh, connection issues that we were having trouble getting on the bus. And, and looking forward with our rail side, we have the engineers over there, we have the managers, the techs that are all working through this. It, it, and not to even, we, I have to also thank our bus instructors who help our operators understand how to use this. So this project has touched almost every aspect of this entire agency already, and we're still in the first phase of it. So I find it really amazing the progress that we've been able to make in the past year. So it gives me really great pleasure to present to you our trademark name, Ready to Ride. You. It's all about planning, being able to pay, ultimately go and doing it in a mobile and fast fast way. So the trademark has been uh, presented. We're uh, working the way through that, that legal aspect right now. We hope to have final approval of that pretty soon. So we're really, really excited to get uh, our Ready to Ride app fully trademarked and uh, in public. So let's see what the app looks like on your phone. It has that little white icon with the uh, blue Ready to Ride typeface on it. And when you tap that app, it opens up with a variety of options. You can buy your tickets right here using a credit or debit card. It shows your tickets in a wallet, both current and past, so you can see your past history of tickets you've bought. Uh, we have links out to many of our other apps and services, being tracking vehicle and our other trip tools that we make available to people, and, and the usual how to ride and help uh, FAQ type services. But we didn't stop and we didn't want to be insular here at the Port Authority. We recognize that many of our customers use a variety of different tools and abilities to use our services. Misabi is working with the Transit app, which hundreds and thousands of our customers already use here. If they don't want to download our Ready to Ride app, perfectly fine. They can continue to use the Transit app, and the Transit app has built an integration for folks to be able to buy their tickets right from there, display them, get on the bus, and keep moving. So we're really giving our customers great flexibility and choice here, but not only are we putting that ticket vending machine in their pocket, we're doing it through multiple channels. They can use our Ready to Ride app, fabulous, or if they want, they can use the Transit app and keep rolling forward with that. So let's see what it looks like. So when you open a ticket on your phone, it, it shows this highly secure validation code. It's a QR code similar to what you might use if you fly and you have a boarding pass. This shows on your uh, screen of your mobile device, and it actually changes every millisecond, which is, uh, helps reduce the fraud. If the validator isn't working for some reason on the bus, uh, the customer can simply show to the operator, and they can see through the date timestamp that it is a valid pass for them to be able to use. So what's this validator thing? So these are new validators that we're installing on our bus, our incline and a rail system. And if you're able to see me, I have a life-size model of it here in my, in my hands. Uh, they've been installed on pretty much all the buses at this point. Uh, unfortunately, due to some of the uptick in activity last 
November, we had to halt installation. So we will be picking up bus installation here next, uh, next month, we hope, to finish up the rest of the bus fleet. Uh, we'll also be installing them on the rail and the incline as we move forward. So the next couple slides sort of show you what it looks like. And I know recently some videos have actually been posted on, on Twitter, which are more real time, but I did this a few days ago. So bear with the old fashioned technology of PowerPoint here. So this is what the validator looks like on the bus, sitting there waiting for a customer to come up. This is our hand model, walking up to the uh, validator and the uh, app is being displayed on that phone there. As they wait a second or so, the validator gives a positive uh, green ding and it shows the valid so that the operator is able to see that the person validated their ticket and they can go on their, with their way. We're actually using the same tones and colors that are used on the existing connect card system. So while these systems are technically separate, folks can decide to use the mobile services or the connect card, whichever ones they want to use, but to the operator, we're trying to make it as seamless as possible in the way that the, the validation occurs, even though there's two different devices in play there. So we're excited to finally get to pilot number two. We'd actually finished pilot number one at the end of February of 19. Early March, we gave Masabi the go ahead to start shipping the validators to us and well, I won't go down that road again. So pilot number two, we just announced this week, it'll start uh, February 2nd of 2021. We've uh, put a public invitation out. We're looking to get about 300 to 400 customers and we're getting very close to that number already who are self-selecting to want to use in, in this pilot mode, either the Ready to Ride app or the Transit app, whichever one is of their choice. Now, because the validators are only on the buses at this point, this pilot will uh, be on the bus lines only. We'll have future pilots on rail and incline when we're ready to get to those points. Now, one positive on this project that we're already recognizing, you know, it's interesting, we had all these delays getting the validators in, getting them installed, getting all these pilots rolling. But a side part of this project is a firm called a Corbato that we, we included in the RFP because we knew we wanted to do a lot of data analysis or on, on where our riders are going and, and how they're using our system. And what Corbata has been able to do is use legacy connect card data. And uh, this is an, uh, Ellie actually ran this project. They wanted to get some, some data on transfer and direct trips uh, around Oakland where people were getting on and people were getting off. And using that connect card data, Corbata was to in, able to infer, not by name, but types of people, where they're getting on and where they're getting off. And this heat map just kind of demonstrates the ability of that data analysis that Corbata has already been able to do to us, with us, for us, um, as a part of this project. So this current phase, the implementation and preparation, uh, one thing we really are, are working through, it's kind of challenging, is uh, we need to get certification for our rail. Because our, our trolleys uh, go underground, we have to get special FTA certification. Uh, that process is ongoing and takes quite a, quite a long time. So that is one of the critical paths for us and it's ongoing. I don't have a timeline yet of when that'll finally be approved. But once it is approved, we'll be able to continue with our validator installations and get these on our, on our rail vehicles. Uh, we're also gonna be installing uh, validators on our rail platforms along with our fare booths that already exist and also on the incline for folks who are coming in from out of town or use the incline as their method of commute. So once those are installed, we'll be able to move forward with some more pilots. We're gonna activate the stored value feature and test that out and then incline and rail. Another uh, critical path aspect for us is late in 2020, we were directed that we need to do a Title VI analysis. And, and Ellie mentioned earlier, the Title VI analysis really tests that equity of the new uh, service that we're providing out. So it's a little bit challenging in this time where our ridership is a little bit off, but Ellie and Amy and lots of other folks are working diligently to make sure that we do the adequate amount of analysis to make sure that the addition of this new service does not uh, inadvertently negatively affect any of our customers. And that was supposed to take an hour and a half, but I made it in like seven minutes. <laughs> so do I have any questions? 
Excellent. Thank you, um, Jeff, and thank you for the seven-minute presentation. And that's right up my alley. Um, <laughs> I do actually have one, but I'd like to permit um, the members of the committee and the board to ask first if you have any. So please, if anyone has a question, please feel free. Jen, I have a point, but it's legal, and I'll let you go first because mine will just bore everybody. Well, um, I'm glad you said it, Jeff, instead of making me say it. Um, <laughs> now, um, I, I also did want to note um, Representative Ms. Gorski is on the call. She's having audio issues. She'd sent a note, and I told her that I'd be happy to mention that she apologizes for not being able to participate. She's participating, but you just can't hear her. So I just want to make a note of that for the record. Um, hey, uh, Jennifer, I, it's on. Yes, John. I just had a quick question, and of course, um, can you talk a little bit about the accessibility of it? Thanks, John. You know, I was supposed to mention my thanks to the CAT committee. I knew I was going to miss one, and I knew you were going to catch me on it. So, yes, what we actually did was uh, back in January of 19, December of, I'm sorry, December 19, January 20, we worked with the CAT committee over at Access Transit. And we, and we had a, a sample validator. Back then it was made out of cardboard because we didn't have a, a real one in yet. And so what we did is we, we talked about where it could fit and where it should fit on the bus to be the, the, the best location for everyone involved. So yeah, we absolutely worked with, with the CAT committee on, on the validators for the bus. And in February, I'll be going back to the committee with the uh, location for the rail on where we are looking to install it on that also. Well, from my perspective, it looks like it's it's more accessible than uh, uh, the the fare box. Um, of course, you know when I was looking at you using your phone, um, my phone's a, a little heavy, so trying to use the phone might be difficult. But the fact of it is, it looks like it's at least more reachable than the fare box. So I just wanted to note that, uh, Jeff. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. Sure. Um, if, if I may, the question that I have relates to. There was testing of other um, modes in which you could get on the bus. So we have our connect card, we have our um, phone, but there was also testing of bracelets or thoughts of other items that could be utilized um, for individuals. How does this software technology um, sync with that? Or is there a thought that we would need to do some steps down the road in, in order to continue with that process of providing other means for people to be able to um, utilize devices to go on to the buses and light rail? Yeah, good question. So at this time, we are keeping the Connect card system and the Connect band bracelets completely separate from the mobile ticketing services. We need to focus on really providing that ability for folks who want to use their mobile device to start using it as quickly as possible. There are possibilities that we're going to explore down the road of how we tie those systems together but we really need to get through phase one, two, and three before we can start looking at how we tie them together closer. At this stage, we have a very established Connect Card uh, customer base. They're welcome to continue using Connect Card. When the Connect bands finally start to come in, I know there's a shipping delay on those. Those folks, folks who use Connect Band will be able to use those also. This provides yet another alternative for folks, and it's by choice of the customer which one they want to use. Oh, that's but great. There are, there, are, there are options on the road that we are exploring. We can't get to them until we really get through the first few phases of this project. I think that's great, Jeff. I just wanted to clarify, and I apologize for the Connect Bank, because I know that was out and tested, and people were yep. excited about that. And so it's nice that this technology is going to still allow for that mode to be used, as well um, as the smartphone to be. I think this is great and great progress, and I think you know, not only Catherine and the team, but you guys in your division should be very proud of the progress. Uh, if there's not any other questions, are there any other questions from members of the board? Seeing none, I believe that was the end of our presentation and technology committee today. So I'd like a motion to adjourn, please. Oh, sorry, Jeff, wait a minute. Jeff, you had a comment, please. Jeff, I apologize. That's <laughs> okay. It's, it's technical, it's legal, and I don't want to bother everybody with it, but I don't know how important, um, Jeff, you feel this ready to ride trademark would be for protection. You're using a copyright note there, which doesn't give you that protection, and you probably should be using the either a TM or SM notation to get that protection. You can deal with that one, Mike. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, good, good point, Jeff. And it's actually part of the process of when we move from the copyright to the TM. And I learned more than I could ever imagine learning in the uh, conversations with our 
lawyers about trademarking. Uh, and when that comes through, we'll be able to change that over to the DM. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, okay. as soon yeah. as you use Excellent. it, you should Good start. Point. You should start doing that. So I don't know what they're telling you, but you should do it now. As soon as you file. Good point. We'll check on that. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Sure. Okay. Um, any more questions or comments? No. Seeing none, I'd um, like a motion to adjourn, please. A motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. And I believe that concludes our committee meetings for today. So on behalf of the Port Authority and all the other chair members and the chairman, I'd like to say thank you to everyone and please stay safe and well. Okay. Have a good day. Thanks. See you all. Thank Friday. you. Next Thanks, Friday. everyone.